church family. We've been so enriched by this family in our church. Emma has given her life to Jesus, right? You love him. Amen. And so today, her dad is going to be baptizing Emma. So Emma, upon your profession of faith in Jesus as your Savior and your Lord, I baptize you, my sister. Your dad baptizes you, rather, his sister and his daughter. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in his death. And raised to walk in this life.
Great, great job, boys and girls. You guys praise the Lord for them and for our men and women who are investing in them every week. Great job, everybody. Great, great job. Wow, 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 wow. Somebody left their ABC gum. Can I have it? Thank you. So giving, so giving and kind. Hey, welcome this morning to Grace Life. I'm so thankful that you're here today to worship the Lord with us. We are so proud of our boys and girls and so thankful for the folks in our worship ministry who are pouring into them and teaching them and mentoring them week in and week out. Very thankful for that. And we're thankful that you are here today. I know the parking lot's getting quite full out there and it's pretty full in here. Would you do me a favor? If you've got some empty seats close by, would you just kind of push in towards Toward the middle a little bit and that way people who are coming in looking for a seat will be able to make sure they get one and in fact I'd take about 12 volunteers right now just to leave your seats and come sit on the front row all right we'll just start amen rows right here because um, for what these were occupied by children and there you go Ed I hear you all right I expect you to stay awake today brother all right so uh, now I know now nobody else to go there's Charlie all right we got the brave guys coming up here. Uh, let me just say welcome to you today. And if you are kind of new to Grace Life and you'd like to find out more about this church family, there is a tearaway tab on our worship guide. If you'd like for us to give you a call or an email or answer any questions you might have, we'd be happy to help you and serve you, pray for you any way that we can. Also, if you're a part of our Grace Life family, and you're not going to be able to stick around the next hour for Sunday school. That's, that's sad, but I understand you may need to be traveling today to go visit family and so forth. Just put your name on the green tab. Just let us know you were in the house today. That will be a blessing to us. We would be very grateful for that. Thank you so much for that. And also on the green tab, if you are interested in becoming a part of this church family or you'd like to find out more about what that entails, our next Membership Matters class is next Sunday. It starts at 1045 in the big room next door. We call that our fireside room. Room. We'll take care of child care and lunch and all that good stuff, so we would love for you to be there uh, and let us know so we can know how much food and how many child care workers that we'll need to have available to us on that day. And Vacation Bible School is just now weeks away. That's really kind of surreal to consider and think about. We're still looking for some volunteers in that ministry. Uh, we'll have about 500 children, so we need a big army to help us out with that. So in particular, continue to pray for us as we're looking for a second grade, third grade, fourth grade teachers. And we also have just a lot of places for people to serve as volunteers and other ways. So thank you for that. And if you're one of those that has already volunteered, uh, you need to register online or in the fireside room uh, today, preferably, because the deadline to get a T-shirt, if you want one of those, is going to be May the 13th. you got to get signed in by that, and I think today's May the 8th. So you don't have another Sunday. It's got to happen this weekend while you're here, okay? Uh, so... And happy Mother's Day uh, to all you moms and grandmothers. And, and at Grace Life, I really prefer to call that uh, Happy Godly Women's Day because uh, we have a lot of women in our church um, that they may not uh, have a child or a grandchild, but those women are equally as special to us because of the way they love us and disciple us and care for us. So it's a great day that we celebrate uh, all of those godly women in our church. And, and I know today is, a, a, for a lot of us, a hard day and a tough day. And I wanted you to know that I've been specifically praying for you, that this would be a, a, an encouraging day to you, that you'll just know the presence of the Lord here with us today in a very special way. So would you stand with me? Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Our children have already led us in some worship, and our teenagers are coming next. They're going to lead us in worship today. I want us just to enjoy that and praise the Lord for children and young men and women giving the Lord their talent and, and having the courage to stand up here and lead us today. So you just fully engage in that. You bless them. You encourage them uh, by the way you engage in the presence of the Lord today. Okay, let's pray. Lord, we want to thank you for this beautiful day. And Lord, we want to thank you indeed, God, for the godly women that you have put into our lives. Some of those are certainly our mothers and grandmothers and sisters and wives and aunts and Sunday school teachers, friends, neighbors, Lord, sisters in the Lord. We're grateful for that, God. Um, Father, we thank you for how you are uh, just continuing to deepen um, women's walk with you at Grace Life. We rejoice in that, Lord. We're rich at this church uh, because of the way that you continue to work in and through the women of this church family. We are just uh, so grateful for that today. 
Uh, Lord, we thank you for our children who've already led us in worship and for our young people who'll come now to do the same. We pray you would fill each of them with your spirit today. Uh, Lord, that they wouldn't worry so much about not messing up. We don't care if they mess up. We want them to love Jesus. We don't ever want Grace Life to be an atmosphere where our children and our young people uh, are afraid to serve you and afraid to worship you. Uh, so, Lord, set them free today to lead their church family to the very throne room of God. And, Lord, we'll be grateful for that and give you the praise and the honor and the glory for that. And we pray it in Jesus' good name. Amen. Hey, we don't do this every Sunday, but I think it'd be really cool if you took just about 30 seconds just to hug some necks or shake a hand or meet somebody. <laughs> Somebody's ready for that. They're jumping on it. All right. You guys, go ahead. Let's start worshiping the Lord together today. Y'all do good.
Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, students. Let me invite our children to come and join me here, and our ushers may come as well. I'm going to move to the... Okay, y'all going to move that for me. Good. I was going to work around it. Hello, boys and girls. Come on in. Come on in. Who has not gotten a ball yet all year? All right, right here, Mr. Jones. Come on. Going for the orange one. I hear you. Look, we don't have many left. Time is flying by. Each ball represented a week since September, the first Sunday of September. And that's all that's left. And moms, dads, meemaws, and peepaws, let that remind us. We don't have a lot of time left with our youngins. I looked up here. We had three seniors singing with our, our praise team and playing in the band. When their senior year started, that bucket was full. And now it's almost gone, right? Not trying to like, make anybody cry or nothing, but I'm just saying, <laughs> time is getting by us quick. We need to make the most of these moments and opportunities we have with our children. Amen? Amen. Hey, I have a story for you guys this morning. Let's see here. It comes from Luke chapter 17. It's called the Ten Lepers. Does anybody know what a leper is? What is a leper? It's a type of spotted wild animal, and that is a leopard, and you're exactly, you're exactly right about that. You nailed it. But this is spelled L-E-P-E-R, not like the animal, a different kind of leper. Do you know what it is, Miss Lay? Yeah, leprosy is a disease, and... People would sometimes call people who had that disease a leper, and it was an awful disease. Uh, leprosy is this horrible disease that really just kind of eats away. It's your skin and your body, and it's, it, and it's really contagious. And so a long time ago, if you had leprosy, you couldn't live in the house with your family. You couldn't live in your neighborhood. You couldn't be around people at all. You just really had to go off by yourself and be really, really sick and eventually die. It was awfully sad. It was a horrible way to live. But you know what? Jesus loves everybody, doesn't he? Do you think Jesus is scared of disease? No, because he can cure any disease, right? He can do anything he wants to. So here's this story about ten lepers. These are ten men that had leprosy. And you, can you imagine how sad their lives must have been, how sad they were? Well, there was a day that all that changed. Check this out. As Jesus was traveling, he met ten lepers. Their bodies were covered with sores, and the lepers shouted, Jesus, please heal us. You know, they had to shout because they had to stay far away from everybody. And Jesus said to them, go, show yourselves to the priest. The ten lepers left, and while they were walking away, something amazing happened. All ten of them were healed, but only one man went back to thank Jesus. He threw himself at Jesus' feet. And he said, thank you. Jesus wondered where the other men were. They did not come back to thank him. Isn't that, isn't that sad that after Jesus changed their lives and he healed them, they didn't even thank him. They didn't even praise him. And you know what? It just makes the heart of God so happy. When you guys come here on Sundays and we sing to God and we praise God and we worship God because all of that is saying thank you Jesus for what you've done for us because he saved us too right now I didn't have leprosy I had something far worse than leprosy sin sin leprosy will make you sick but sin separates you from God which is far worse but Jesus healed me and he'll heal you today if you trust him to save you and so we always want to give God our thanks right right one of the ways that we show God our thankfulness is by giving to him part of what he gives to us. And you guys bring your offerings here every week. I'm so proud of you for that. So let's invite Brother Phil Bonnet. He's going to come. And if you have an offering to give to the Lord today, Brother Phil will receive that. And then he'll pray for our church and you and your families in our day to day. Amen. Isn't that wonderful to see the, the excitement of the children as they give and, and the enthusiasm in which they, they gave? Uh, join me as we pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Father. Oh, we thank you for the healing that you uh, 
uh, gave me so many years ago, Father. Uh, I thank you for uh, your mercy and your grace and, and your goodness and your faithfulness. Uh, Father, this day as we, uh, we've set this day aside to uh, celebrate our, our mothers and to honor them, uh, and certainly we do, Father, uh, but every day is a day, according to your word, that we're to honor our mothers and our fathers. And, and so, Father, help us live in such a way that would, would show uh, our respect and our honor to them. And then, Father, as we uh, come here today to, just to worship you and to praise you, Father, uh, help us to honor you in a way that would be um, appropriate and proper. Uh, Father, bless these tithes and these offerings. Use them, Father, to further your kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. kids come up and uh, give an offering with enthusiasm. All the parents that are teaching these kids are great parents. Um, the song we're about to sing was pulled directly out of Ezekiel chapter 37 verses 4 through 6. Then he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. And I will say, Sinems upon you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord.
Amen. Thank you, students. Fantastic job. We're so grateful for y'all, for all of our students. I love my pulpit. Don't you guys? If you don't know, this is the steeple that blew over during the tornado back on March the 1st. So now it's a pulpit. Really, I dig it. It's got wheels. Have you noticed that? I'm going to show that off every week. I love it so much. Hey, Jenny. Good to see you and the boys today. Glad that you're here. been praying for you guys, for the Glenn family as they transition ministry down around... Lake Charles, Louisiana now, so pray for Ricky and Jenny Glenn and their boys as they go serve the Lord down in Lake Charles. Glad to have you. This is still home in our, our opinion, right? So glad y'all are here today. If you have a Bible this morning, I invite you to turn to Acts chapter 6. We have been preaching through very slowly the book of Acts this year since January, and here we are, Acts chapter 6. We, we dealt with Acts chapter 6 a couple of weeks ago. But I just wanted to go back there and kind of take a different place, just look at a different, uh, look at that a little differently than last time we were there in Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6 verse 1 says, In those days, as the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint by the Hellenistic Jews against the Hebraic Jews that their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Just, just a reminder, we, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, but two groups of widows here in the early church. The first group of widows were people who were native to the Jerusalem city and area, that vicinity. That's where their family lived. That's where they had their resources. That's where they found their roots. That was their hometown, their home community and area. But there was um, Hellenistic Jews uh, these Hellenistic Jews, these widows, uh, they, were, they were people who grew up in a Greek culture. They weren't from around those parts. But because of the birth of the church, they now found themselves living in that community, living in and around that city. They didn't have the resources. They didn't have the family roots that the Hebrew Jews had there. And so because of that, that kind of lent itself to a bad situation happening. They were... Um, all too easily overlooked when it came to the daily distribution of food. At that time, um, poverty was a real issue uh, in, in around Jerusalem in the first century, especially poverty uh, as it related to widows in that community. And so to go a day without having your daily needs met, to not have food for that day, was a big issue. And that had happened uh, enough that there was a dispute that rose up in the early church. And so we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, that the 12 apostles summoned the whole company of the disciples, and they said it would not be right for us to give up preaching about God to wait on tables. Therefore, brothers, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit and wisdom, whom we can appoint to this duty, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and the preaching ministry. Then verse 7 says, after they did that, the preaching about God flourished, and the number of disciples in Jerusalem multiplied greatly, and a large group of priests became obedient to the faith. Now, out of everything that we talked about from that passage a couple of weeks ago, the one thing that I didn't emphasize that I want to come back today and emphasize is this, God's care and God's concern for the widow. Now, when the Bible talks about the widow, the word that it uses to describe a widow is not necessarily just what we typically think of, a woman who has uh, experienced the loss of her husband to death. Really, the word that's used there in the Greek is a little bit broader than that. It doesn't just limit a, a, a woman who has had her husband passed away, but rather it's broader in the sense of that the word seems to convey, this is a woman who is alone. This is a woman who maybe her husband died, maybe her husband deserted her, maybe her husband has been imprisoned, but for whatever reason now she finds herself in this state. And I want us to focus about that today. And, and, and part of that reason is because this is the way God has designed his creation. This is the way God has designed us as people as men and women, it is God's design that women are to be the object of special care. Now, our world needs to hear that message today. 
Because that's not the way that women are being treated and esteemed and valued and honored in this world in which we live. And it should be very different among the people of God. It should be different among those who name Jesus as their Savior and as their Lord. God's design is that women are to be provided for, that women are to be protected. I know this is not popular, but this is true, and the Bible says it's true. Jay, glad you're home, man, from the military. One of our young people who graduated last year, just I love get to shepherd while I preach, man, and just see people I love, and I love Jay Heinerman. I'm glad you're home for a little bit, man. We're proud of you, man, and we pray for you often. Uh, sorry, rabbit. Um, I know this is not very popular, but this is what the Scripture says, and it's true. Women are the weaker vessels. That doesn't mean that they're less important, by no means. That doesn't mean that they're less valuable, not at all. In fact, I was performing a wedding last night, and one of the things that I said at this gorgeous Christ-honoring wedding last night was that God saw that Adam needed a helpmate. So God created women to be helpmates. And I'm always amazed at the women who go, well, that's offensive that we're helpmates. And I go, as a dude, I find it more offensive that God looked at us and went, they need some help. <laughs> right? So I'm not really sure why you get bent out of shape about that. I, I think we're the ones that kind of got singled out there in that. So we're thankful for women. And God has intended gentlemen for us to love and honor and protect and to provide for those women around us. And it's because of how God has designed that relationship that widows in particular, women who have experienced the death or the desertion or whatever it may be of their spouse, women in that condition have an incredibly special place in the heart of God. Widows or women who have lost a husband, who have little or no resources, they are very special concerns to the heart of God. God takes tremendous care in making sure that those ladies are provided for, that they're protected and cared for. Scripture speaks about another group of people in our society who have a very special care of the Lord on their lives, and that's the orphans. We'll be talking about that a little bit later this month. This is Foster Care Awareness Month, and so we'll be talking about that also as a church family. But again and again, the Bible's clear that our God and His goodness and His mercy and His grace, He has a special care and concern for those who don't have the protection or provision that He desires for them to have in their life. Children, as you know, are to be under the care, under the leadership and under the protection of their parents. And, and when a child loses that, that child, and, and I know there's children in the room here today that, are, that, that you know, you're foster children, you live in a foster home, and you need to hear this. You, boys and girls, the Bible tells us clearly, you have the special care of God on your life. And I want you to know that. And I want you to hear that today. That's the heart of God. He loves you. And his special attention and care is towards you. Women also are to be under the care and the protection of their husbands. And when a woman has lost that, God steps in to be her husband. God steps in to take up her case. Widows are the object of the attention of God. And therefore... All of those of us who say that we are following God, all of those of us who are a part of the faith family who say that we are Christ followers, we need to emulate God in that sense. We also should treat widows the same way that God treats them. Exodus chapter 22, verse 23, the Bible says that when widows cry out and no one hears their cry, God says, I will hear your cry. The Old Testament is clear over and over again how, about how God takes up the cause of the widow. 
But not only is the Old Testament clear about the special concern and compassion and care for God for the widow, but the Gospels are very clear about that too. As we read in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, we see God's care and concern for the widows again and again. For example, Mark chapter 12, you know, they're familiar with the story with the, the widow who came to the temple that day and all she had was just a mite. Just that's all she had, and she gave that to the Lord. And, and in that story, Jesus there is, is, is demonstrating, and the Scripture demonstrates there for us again, just how destitute many of those women in the first century truly were. That they were very, very poor. That it was oftentimes scarce, the resources and the help that they could find. And yet this woman caught the attention of Jesus. We see because his attention fell on her and he pointed her out that he was compassionate and merciful and attentive to this lady. In Luke chapter 7, beginning in verse 11, if you want to go there, you're welcome to. If you want to listen along, I'll just share this. It says, soon afterward, Jesus went with his disciples to the village of Nain and a large crowd followed him. A funeral procession was coming out as he approached the village gate. The young man who had died was a widow's only son. Connect the dots there now. This, this lady was not only a widow, she had had now a son who was caring for her. He was her protector, he was her provider, but now he's out of the picture himself. And so now this woman is in a very unprotected condition. She is in a place where there is no one that is left now to care for her and provide for her. And so this funeral procession is going on and a large crowd from the village was with the widow. And when the Lord Jesus saw her, this is what the text says, his heart overflowed with compassion. My gracious, when the scripture speaks about the heart of Jesus and it says that it overflowed with compassion. I don't know what that looked like in that moment, but this was a stellar moment to see what the compassion of God toward the hurting and the vulnerable, the widow, really looks like. And Jesus said, don't cry. He couldn't stand it any longer. Aren't you thankful for a God like this? He said, don't cry. He walked over to the coffin, and he touched it, and the pallbearer stopped. Young man, he said, I tell you, get up. And then the dead boy sat up and began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. And it's something that Jesus raised the dead that day just simply for the benefit of that widow. He cares. He's concerned. Jesus had compassion on her because God cares for the widow. And there's other examples we could go to in the Gospels, but the most obvious example that underscores for us how Jesus taught us to care for the widows is found when Jesus himself is bearing the sin of the world on himself, absorbing the wrath of God as a substitute for you and for me. There on the cross, Jesus directly spoke only to three different people. You know, he spoke directly to one of the thieves on the cross, right? And he said, today you'll be with me in paradise. But then he also spoke directly to the disciple that he loved, that is John. And he also directly spoke to his mother, Mary. And what we see Jesus do in that conversation with John and with Mary is that he commits his widowed mother into the care of his closest disciple. Because there as he died on the cross... Bearing the full wrath of God against sin. He cared for his mother. He cared for her as a human being, as a widow. He wanted to finish his work as a good son by making sure that she would be protected. To make sure that she was provided for. The heart of God comes through so clear when we see how Jesus talked about widows. When we see how Jesus treated his own widowed mother. And his heart comes through so clear when we see how the scripture instructs us how to care for widows. When you get to Acts chapter 6, it has become very obvious that one of the first ministries of the local church was to care for the widows. The daily distribution of food didn't start in Acts chapter 6, did it? It broke down in Acts chapter 6. 
which means the daily distribution of the food was already going on in the local church. It was one of the first ministries that we find there. And then just a few chapters later, if you still got your face there on Acts chapter 6, just go over to Acts chapter 9, and we see another demonstration of how God cares for the widows. Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 36, it says, There was a believer in Joppa named Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. She was always doing kind things for others. Anybody know a lady like that? Yeah, we do. We, this, this, this lady, we don't know her to be a widow. She could have been, but I don't think the scripture says that. I may be reminded as I read and go, oh yeah, it does. But at this moment, I don't think so. I, she, she, but she is a kind lady, always doing things to help other people. And it says in particular, helping the poor. And as you're going to see in just a moment... In particular, the poor that she was helping, by and large, were widows. They were those who found it difficult to even find a mite to put in the offering plate. Those were the people. Those widow people were the people that Tabitha was helping. And about this time, the Bible says that Tabitha became ill, and she died. Her body was washed for burial and laid in an upstairs room. But the believers had heard that Peter was nearby at Lydda. So they sent two men to beg him, please come as soon as possible. So Peter returned with them. As soon as he arrived, they took him to the upstairs room. The room was filled with... Widows. They had been the recipients of Tabitha's care and compassion. Tabitha had honored the Lord by the way she had treated these women. And these widows were weeping and showing Peter the coats and other clothes that Dorcas had made for them. See, they were the poor that she had been serving, that she had been ministering to. She made sure that they had clothes on their backs. She made sure that they had a coat when it got cold. But Peter asked them all to leave the room. And then he knelt and he prayed. And turning to the body, he said, get up, Tabitha. And she opened her eyes. When she saw Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her up. And then he called in the widows and all the believers. And he presented her to them alive. This is the second time that we see a resurrection that seems to be for the sole purpose of making sure that widows were taken care of. Even death is not going to stop our God from loving the widow. He raised the dead so that the widow would have somebody to show them compassion and kindness and concern. And James, the half-brother of Jesus, sums it up. In James chapter 1, he says, Pure religion undefiled before God is this, to visit the orphans and the widows. In their affliction. So clearly, God has a special compassion. Clearly, God has a special care. Clearly, God has a special concern for widows. He wants them to be protected. He wants them to be provided for. The Old Testament shows us that. The gospel shows us that. The ministry of Jesus shows us that. The book of Acts shows us that. Even the epistles, which is a fancy word for letters. When we get past the book of Acts, we get into all these letters that... People of God wrote to pastors or to local congregations of churches. And when we read those letters or those epistles, we get instructions again about how we as the people of God represent God. And we're supposed to represent God in the way that we care for the weak and the vulnerable, the suffering, the afflicted among us, be they orphans or widows or whoever they may be. So I want to take you to 1 Timothy chapter 5 as we continue this thought this morning. 1 Timothy chapter 5. And I want to pick that up in verse 3. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 3. Paul says, Take care of any widow who has no one else to take care of her. But if she has children or grandchildren, their first responsibility is to show godliness at home and repay their parents by taking care of them. This is something that pleases God. Now, verse 5, a true widow... A woman who is truly alone in this world, who has placed her hope in God. She prays night and day, asking God for His help. But the widow who lives only for pleasure is spiritually dead, even while she lives. Give these instructions to the church so that no one will be open to criticism. Verse 8, but those who won't care for their relatives, especially those in their own household, have denied the true faith. Such people 
are worse than unbelievers. Verse 3 makes it abundantly clear this morning to us that the first people who should be caring for the widow is her family. First and foremost, it is the family's responsibility. And again, I remind you, the New Testament here doesn't seem to be limiting a widow to a person who has experienced the death of a spouse. We have a number of situations in our church family that I see women who are in situations that no fault of their own have lost their husband to something other than death. I think the call to serve the widow applies to them just as much as it applies to that lady who has lost a husband because he's passed away. So when we talk about widows today, let's, let's take all of that in. Let's consider all of those women who, at no fault of their own, no longer have the protection or the provision of a man in the home. And I believe that God has a special care and concern for women like that. We should, too. Our deacon ministry has talked about this over the years, trying to figure out how, how can we strengthen and expand our deacon ministry so that we're not only trying to make sure that those ladies in our church family who have had the death of a spouse are cared for, but those other ladies who are in unique situations and circumstances, how can we make sure that they are as well? So you pray for us as we try to figure out how to better honor the Lord by meeting those needs and serving those people. But I think the scripture is clear here that this is not just the ministry of deacons. And it's not just the ministry of pastors, but it's the ministry of the people of God. If you know Jesus, you're a Christ follower, we're all called to do this. And one of the things I fear at Grace Life is because our deacon ministry is so focused on caring for the widows among us that you all too easily might just look at widow ministry and think to yourself, well, that's what the deacons do. No, no, the deacons just lead us in doing that. It's all of us. We all get to do that together. That's our privilege and our responsibility. That's how we get to emulate the Lord Jesus Christ and meet the needs of the people who are around us because of the breakdown of the home that we see in our society today. One of the things that we're going to see in the coming years, we're beginning to see this now, is we're going to see a tremendous increase in the women in our local churches who have needs in their life, who don't have a father that would be their protector and provider, who don't have a husband to be their protector and their provider. I, I would even dare say that maybe since the first century, we're about to walk into an era in the history of the church where we will see more unprotected, vulnerable women among us than we have ever seen before. Those days are coming. In Grace Life, we need to be ready to answer that call. We need to be ready to give of ourselves. We need to be ready to allocate more resources to make sure that no woman in the church, no woman among the faith family is not having her needs met. God would have us to do that. In the days of the early, early church, many women were struggling in poverty with nobody to help them. So you know what happened? God's people stepped in. The family of faith stepped in. The church stepped in. And caring for the widow has been what the church has been doing for the last 2,000 years. In fact, today, the welfare system that we have in this country is a direct result of the way that the church cared for the weak and the vulnerable and the needy for the last 2,000 years. A lot of people in our country today might not want to admit that. But that's exactly where it came from. Countries without a Christian influence don't have a system in place that cares for the widow among them or the weak or the vulnerable. But nations that have been shaped by the gospel and by Christianity, you can find that there are systems in place where people like that are provided for and cared for. Notice what 1 Timothy chapter 5 says to us Christians. We are to take care of widows. We're to honor them. That means we treat them well. We esteem them highly. We make sure that their needs are met. But not every widow needs the help of the church. There are widows who have family. 
This doesn't mean that the church is forbidden to help those widows. That doesn't mean there's a line of demarcation there and we go, well, we are not to help them because they have children. They have grandchildren. That's not what that means. It's not mandated to the church to help the widows who have children and grandchildren. But certainly we can assist and serve, and this church does. But what is mandated here in the Scripture, what is not up for debate, is if there are children and grandchildren in the picture, they must care for the widow among them within their own family. Chapter 5, verse 1 says, Take care of any widow who has no one to take care of her. Some translations talk about a true widow. A genuine widow. We'll talk about what that is in a moment. But if she has children or grandchildren, their first responsibility. When the scripture says first there, it says it in the sense of priority. Their priority is to show godliness at home and repay their parents by taking care of them. This is something that pleases God. When we find a widow in our family, everything else begins to take a back seat to making sure that her needs are met that she's provided for, that she's protected. That becomes our first responsibility. We, we can't go around saying, hey, I'm a mature Christ follower. I'm a godly person. And yet there's a woman in our family whose needs aren't being met. God says here, this is, this is what pleases God. You want to talk about what's godly? Godliness starts at home, the way we care for those in our lives. In other words, God's saying, if you say you're godly, but you aren't taking care of your mother or grandmother, you're kidding yourself. Your first responsibility is to take care of your parents when they need you. I'm thankful that I see that at Grace Life all the time. Thankful for that. Our deacon who prayed today, not only does he care for widows in our church, he has a mom that's about 90 years old with a lot of issues, a lot of challenges. And just to see the way that he gives his life in a difficult situation to make sure that his mother's cared for, that her needs are met, I'm thankful that we have great examples in our church family. So from time to time, there's bad examples. The Bible speaks to that, verse 8. But those who won't care for their relatives, especially those in their own household, God says they've denied the true faith. Such people are worse than unbelievers. In other words, even a decent unbeliever knows that they ought to take care of mom and grandma. How much more should a Christ follower who's been brought from death to life, who has the Spirit of God living and residing in them, how much more should they be caring for their mother and their grandmother? And if they don't do that, they deny the very faith that they claim to have. They act worse than somebody who doesn't even believe. And again, you hear the heart of God there for the widow. Do you hear that? Do you hear the passion of the Lord? For these women, he takes their protection and he takes their provision serious. And God's expectation is that the front line of caring for these women will come from their family members. If there is no family, then the family of God steps in. And again, that doesn't mean we just hand them to the deacon ministry. It doesn't mean that we just call the pastor and say something must be done. It means you. Every single one of you who's following Jesus as the faith family, we get to step into that gap when there is no family. And we do that here. We see that so often here. And I think about Miss Haney. Great example. James and Margie Haney. Sweet, faithful couple in our church family for many years. Only a handful of you even know who I'm really even talking about. They've been with the Lord now for some years. And Mr. and Miss Haney never had children of their own. They, but they acted like a mother and a father to so many of us, the way they loved us and taught us and shared life with us and encouraged us. And we were standing there beside Miss Haney when Mr. Haney went to meet the Lord. And we stood there as Miss Haney later, years later. She also went to meet the Lord. But before Miss Haney went to meet the Lord and her husband was gone and she had no children, you know what happened in this church? Many of the faith family stepped in. And treated Miss Haney like she was their mother. Because she had acted that way for so many years. In particular, Miss Ruby Hurt. Just stepped in and was a daughter to to Brother James and to Miss Margie. And served them so faithfully and and so well. Miss Ruby gave everything she had. But even then, it wasn't enough at times. And 
we reached a point, I remember, that Miss Haney needed more care, kind of round the clock. And by that time, Miss Haney didn't have any resources left. Everything that Mr. Haney had been able to save and put aside for her in that event, it, it was all gone. And Miss Ruby couldn't take that on herself. So this is a genuine, a true widow with no family to care for her. A sister in the Lord had done all that she could do. So then you know what happened? The church stepped in. I'll never forget the night that the church got together and we said, here's the situation. She needs medical care. Somebody's got to pay for that. That's our privilege. Nobody said that's what we got to do. Nobody said that's our duty. We did it with joy in our hearts, didn't we, church? We did it with a smile on our face because that was a privilege by God's grace that we got to serve that sweet lady in those days in her life. And that honored the Lord. I, listen, Grace Life, when we come up here and we do that kind of math like I did last week, I don't think we'd be doing that if, if we had ignored that cry. If we had turned our back on those who needed us, we, we could not. We would have no reason to expect the favor of God, the hand of God, the blessing of God to be on our church family. And may we never, ever lose sight of that. Listen, church, in the grand scheme of things, it's not how much property we have or how big the building is or how big the offerings is. It's about being Jesus, the hands, the feet, and Jesus in the world that you and I live in. And as long as that's where our hearts are, as long as that's what we are determined to do, God's going to take care of all those details. I promise you, I assure you that he will. He says when you love him with all your heart, you seek first his kingdom, he'll take care of all those details, right? And he will. That's how it's supposed to work. Family, you do all that you can do. And if there is no family, then brothers and sisters in Christ, you step in. And you do all that you can do. And when you can't do any more, then the church collectively will rise up to meet that need together, corporately. But let's notice that God hasn't called the church to take care of every widow in the world. I mean, we need to know that today. It's not our responsibility to care for all the widows of the world. Scripture doesn't teach us to do that. Look at verse 5. Paul writes, now a true widow, a woman who is truly alone in this world. So first of all, a true widow is a woman who has needs. There's nobody, nobody to help her. But not only that, but a true widow relative to the church is a widow who has placed her hope in God. She's a godly woman, a godly widow. The Bible describes this true widow as a woman who prays night and day, asking God for his help. Verse 6, but the widow who lives only for pleasure is spiritually dead even while she lives. Listen, a widow that the church is mandated to help, a widow that the church is called by God to help, is the woman who, first of all, is truly alone, and second of all, who is living a godly life, who loves the Lord, who's hoping in God. She's in fellowship with God. She's depending on God. So Christians are only required to help godly widows. That's the only kind of widow the church is required to help. We may choose to serve and help an unsaved or an ungodly widow. But we don't have to. Only godly widows are our responsibility. Now, some of you are looking at me kind of weird like, well, why wouldn't we care for an ungodly widow? You know, sometimes, I, I think in our efforts to always show people the love of Jesus, we end up not showing them the love of Jesus. It might be best sometimes if we just left people to know the consequences of their own sinfulness. If there's a, a widow who is looking to the world to fulfill her heart and desires and to meet her needs, and she's not desiring to follow the Lord and walk with the Lord, the last thing we need to do is underwrite her sinfulness. The last thing we need to do is to support her journey in walking away. From the Lord Jesus Christ. God uses the consequences of our sin 
to make us desperate so that we might turn and run home to him. Does he not? That's what happened in the story of the prodigal son. The father just backed off. He allowed him to do what it was that he wanted to do. He allowed him to hit rock bottom so that his desperation might, perhaps by the grace of God, turn his heart back to home. Well, listen, if we, church, if we go down to every single pigsty and bring takeout from the bright star several nights a week, why are they going to want to leave the pigsty? Why are they going to want to turn and repent and chase after the Lord? We don't need to be trying to cushion everybody's fall. Sometimes if you really love people, you've got to let them smack the bottom. Paul says here that a widow who's living apart from trusting God is already spiritually dead. Therefore, we don't have any responsibility to come to their aid and assist them in living an ungodly life. And I can hear it. I hear it all the time. That just seems heartless. That just seems mean, Joel. That seems... That seems cruel. That seems unloving. I get accused of that from time to time. My children, I'm sure, have felt that way from time to time. Let me tell you, church, I think the, the most deep kind of love in our world that we see is what has kind of popularly, popularly been called tough love. You know why we call it tough love? And I know y'all know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about tough. You know why we call it tough love? Leon, tough love isn't tough for the person who's running away to the pigsty. So they could care less. Tough love is tough on that person who loves the one who's running the wrong way. <laughs> tough love is tough on the one who's having to bring the hand of discipline into that situation. That's why we call it tough love. Because it's hard. It hurts our hearts. It's painful. It's sorrowful. There's grief. And, and, and if you've ever been there, you know that you just wrestle with guilt. And you wrestle with shame and anxiety and fear and all this kind of stuff. The easy thing to do is just keep taking takeout to the pigsty. That's the easy thing to do. And those of you who think that's what Jesus would do, read your Bible. That's not what Jesus would do. He loves us too much to give us what we want. He loves us and he gives us what we need. And sometimes people need our silence. Sometimes people need our separation. I've come to know in my older age that some people, the only way I can minister to them is with my silence and with my prayers. I have nothing else to offer. Nothing else that would be nearly as effective, perhaps, as just being quiet and being prayerful. Sometimes the most loving thing we can do is turn our backs on someone in hopes that they'll stop turning theirs on God. That's not easy. My son, who was leading worship up here a while ago, I know I'm not supposed to talk about you, but too bad. Um. He's just kind and gentle. Y'all know Isaiah. He's like that. But there was this phase when he was about two years old. He was the bully of the church nursery at Loveless Park Baptist Church. Some of y'all may remember that. Uh, me and Shannon were beginning to lose friends around here in those days because he was just attacking kids in the nursery and we tried everything we spanked him we talked to him we everything we could think of and i remember this one particular wednesday night i was still here at the church it was late shannon called me they were already home and uh and she said he did it again i don't know what to do you know i'm getting i'm getting the stink eye from people at church <laughs> You know, it's just, I don't even want to go anymore. I don't know what to do. I mean, our kid, the bully. We didn't, we tried everything we knew how to do. And that night when I got home, you know, the life of a youth pastor, it was 9, 9.30, and your two-year-old's still up waiting to have dinner with you. I hadn't seen him all day. You know, 
you want to play with them, you want to talk to them, you want to spend that time with them. But that night, I had a plan. Tough love time. Tough on dad. Because that night, what, what I did was I acted like he wasn't even there. And I opened the door, he came running up to me like he always did, and I just kept moving. I didn't look down, didn't touch him. I just ignored him. We sat down to eat, I didn't acknowledge his presence, just ignored him completely. He began to pick up that something's not cool here. He was doing everything he could do to try to get my attention, and I would not relent. It was killing me. I was weeping on the inside. I was dying on the inside. But I just got to press through. I got to press through because I love my kid more than I love me. See, if you're not disciplining your kids, it's not because you love them. It's because you love you. You love you too much to feel bad. Right? Well, I love my kids more than I love me. I'm just going to feel bad. It really does hurt me more than it hurts you. And it was killing me that night just to ignore, ignore, ignore. And he was doing everything he could do to try to get my attention. He finally got down from the table. He went to play with his dump truck, and the dump fell off the truck. And he brought it to me in his hands. He said, Daddy, fix it. And Daddy did this. <laughs> and that's how we rolled that night. His mama took him to put him in the bed. After she did the nightly routine in there, then I finally went in, and I told him just how sad it made my heart, the way that he was treating people. I was really sad, and I told him I loved him, and I walked out. That was the last time he ever bullied anybody in the nursery again. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace. <laughs> Because y'all all know we don't always work, right, as parents sometimes. But thank the Lord that God taught me something from that. God's telling us here in the scripture we aren't required to care for an ungodly widow. In fact, it's probably the most loving thing to do if we don't. But we don't. But he is telling families to take care of their own family members. And then he calls men and women of God to step into the gap when there is no family and then in verse 7, God kind of calls the whole church together. He says, all right, everybody in. Let's just kind of summarize this. He says in verse 7, give these instructions to the church so that no one will be open to criticism. In other words, God says the reputation of the church is at stake when it comes to this issue. The glory of God is at stake when it comes to this issue, how we care for widows. So let's summarize. Widows, do your part. Be widows that honor the Lord, that pursue the Lord, who love Him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Children and grandchildren of widows, it is your most important responsibility to make sure that that lady is protected and provided for. If you turn your back on your mother or your grandmother, you need to check your salvation. That's what the scripture says. And Christians, brothers and sisters in the Lord, if there's a God-fearing lady in your world and she has nobody to protect her, nobody to provide for her, then you step in like Miss Ruby did and others. And you treat her like she's your mother or your grandmother. And when you can't do any more to help her, then you call on the family of faith. And church, we better answer that call. If we don't answer that call, we just might ought to go ahead and expect God's going to stop answering ours. Maybe you're thinking, you know, this doesn't really apply to me today, Joel. I don't have any widows in my family. I think it does apply to every single one of us. What about the single mom who needs a female friend or a frozen dinner in the freezer? What about that? What about the Christian lady whose husband is being destroyed? By an addiction. She isn't a widow maybe in the technical sense. But she is nevertheless a woman who needs some provision. And some protection. Our society is falling apart. In Grace Life we're going to see more and more women in our own church. In our own community. That don't have adequate provisions and adequate protection in their life. And you and I have the privilege of getting to be the hands and feet of Jesus. In those situations. I, I want Grace Life, and I've said this many times, I want Grace Life to be the kind of church Jesus would go to. Don't you? I promise you this, he wouldn't go to a church that turns its back on widows. 
He wouldn't go to a church that doesn't care for the weak and the vulnerable and the suffering in our world. I want us to be like Jesus in that way, Grace Life. I want you to make this day special. Beyond a card or a gift or a hug, would you just really ask the Lord, God, even beyond my own mother or grandmother, God, who are those in the realm of my life? that you would have me to love today, and not just today, but this week, to be looking for those opportunities. Maybe maybe you help a lady who's a mother and a grandmother. Maybe she's not a mother or grandmother. It doesn't really matter. God cares for women in particular. and We should too. And listen, if you can't find a way to do that, then I got something real practical you can help me with this Saturday, this coming Saturday. I'd love to have some volunteers to help me work on a lady's yard. She's an elderly lady right here in our neighborhood. I only met her last week. She's lived here for 40-something years. And to my knowledge, she's never been to our church. And she doesn't have anybody that is able-bodied to be able to help her. Um, and, and her concern when I talk to her is that she can't trim her bushes. Her backyard's really grown up. She said, there's lots of people robbing and breaking in homes. And she said, I'm scared that people can just hide in my yard. And I can't see out my windows. And she's, she's legitimately scared. She knows that there's not that protection in her life that God wants her to have. And she said, now, if somebody could put a handrail up for me to help me get up and down my steps, I would appreciate that. So if, if, if you want to help with that, uh, I would love to have your help next Saturday morning, 8 o'clock. The lady's name is Miss Graham, all right? So we're going to call this Grace for Miss Graham. And we'll come hang out 8 o'clock next Saturday morning. And then in just a couple of hours, I think we can really uh, lift her spirits and show her the love of Jesus. So I invite you to, to come and to be a part of that. And if you know of other needs that are too big for you to single-handedly take care of on your own, then feel free. Just to share that. Say, hey, this, this is somebody that doesn't have anybody in her family that could do this for her. And sometimes, you know, the way we need to serve those folks is we need to go to their family and say, you need to get off your backside. <laughs> you sorry piece of... You wouldn't say that to them, right? <laughs> but you're kind of thinking, come on, get with the program, man. But if you know of needs and you can't do it all by yourself, then, then let your church family know. We want this to remain a priority in our hearts and our minds in the days ahead. I want to ask you to stand with me, and I want us to pray together. Lord, I, I'm just concerned that in the modern world that we live in, We, we maybe have kind of lost sight of your heart relative to women. I, I know today it's just so common to see women educated and successful and being able to, to do so much, God, and, and, and we, we're thankful for that. But Lord, I, I pray that, that that would never cause our hearts to drift away from the truth of your word that you created women very uniquely special and that the way that you look upon them is different than the way you look upon men and that in particular there is a special grace and concern for women who are vulnerable and weak and who lack resources that you're the kind of God that raises the dead just so that widow's cared for. I don't think there's anything you would not do to care for a true widow in need. And God, I pray that we would be able to say the same thing about ourselves and our church family. That there's nothing we wouldn't be willing to do to care for the weak and the vulnerable the defenseless in our world. 
that we don't want to just be a church that has Bible studies and classes and sing songs. We want to roll our sleeves up. We want to, we want to serve. That's who we are. You've called us to be a family of servant missionaries. So Holy Spirit, work in our hearts. Draw our focus, our attention away from ourselves and our selfishness. And help us to be more like the one who gave his life for us. The one who came not to be served, but to serve. Holy Spirit, make us more like Jesus. To the glory of the Father. To the good of your people. And we ask it in Jesus' good name. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's worship the Lord together. And let's just make this our prayer to the Lord today. This is the way we want to live our lives, God. I, I want to be the one who carries your hope, your life, your light into a world of people who need that. God, here I am. Use me. Send me however you desire, Lord. Let's sing to the Lord. Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Preach good.
Aren't you thankful that we serve a God who is so good, so compassionate, so merciful, so kind? If you came here today just feeling alone and abandoned, you came here today kind of feeling like you're fighting an uphill battle, I hope today, man or woman, you came feeling like that today, that you've been reminded that our God cares for people who feel the way that you woke up maybe feeling today, that His eye is on you. And whatever need may exist in your life, if you'll turn to Him, I believe he'll meet that need. Now, not the greeds, all right? Big difference. But the needs, whatever that may be, emotional, physical, relational. Those widow ladies that he described, women who hope in God. And those who hope in God, you know what they will never be? Disappointed. Those of us who hope in God will never ever be disappointed so put your hope there today hope you have a great great day today i hope you get to spend some time with people that you love and hope you get to relax and rest and just breathe a little bit today i hope that you're not having to travel and ball and all that kind of stuff now we got us we don't do travel ball but we got a school activity today so that's kind of unusual but we're going to enjoy that and just i hope you get to enjoy your family today okay and god bless you guys we will see you next sunday got some snacks in the fireside room help yourself go to sunday school